look, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're ambitious. You want to change the world tomorrow, right? Think about like Steve Jobs, right? This, this guy starts companies, like gets kicked out of his own company. Like if you look at his journey, he didn't come up with Apple like iPhone, like overnight. Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So today, very exciting guest, a guest that has been there, has done it, you know, has saying now he's on his second company. The first one was a really nice outcome. Uh, but I guess without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Hossein Asari. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Alejandro. It's great to be here. So originally from Iran, from a place that it was very cold, close to the mountains. So how was how was life growing up there? Uh, well, it was cold, but it was fun. So uh, it's uh, northwest of Iran, Iran. Like, I mean, you heard about Turkey. It's very close to the Turkey border. Um, so it was fun. And uh, um, yeah. <laughs> and was there like anyone in your family that was an entrepreneur or in business? Or how did you get that incredible drive and ambition? Yeah, pretty much everybody. So, so the thing is, but back home, uh, you gotta be an entrepreneur, right? So you hear in some of the developing countries, entrepreneurship is pr probably your top choice. You don't have the corporate jobs, or maybe you have a smaller companies that they would hire, but they they won't they wouldn't hire as much. So, um, so entrepreneurship is how everybody kind of starts thinking, um, unless you work for government. Uh, which is also another alternative. So my family, my dad, uncles, they, they were all uh, building things from the time that, I mean, you know, I was growing up, my dad would take me to the deal rooms that they would negotiate stuff and I would just run around with the papers and stuff. So uh, it's it, I, I had a lot of exposure to that kind of life um, and seeing how things are. So then why Harvard? Because obviously, you know, here you are, you're seeing everyone, you know, doing their thing and they're in Iran, you know, like uh, making business happen. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, you decide that it's time to pack the bags and come all the way to the U.S. and, and going to Harvard. So, so tell us about what was that journey like and, and why? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there was a kind of, when you look at, look backward, you do, do, do see some disconnect from entrepreneurship uh, uh, and surface, but actually it was a lot of adventure. So uh, for a like 22 year old kid who, or even 18 year old kid who is like now getting to learn stuff. I wanted to study in a school uh, to kind of, that was top tier. I wanted to like see what's the rest of the world, you know, and then you take it to the next step. And then uh, you have basically us as the place that, you know, things happen. <laughs> possibilities so um uh, you really don't envision what will exactly be well it, what it will exactly be but uh you see a lot of opportunities and then uh, there's a lot of uh, respect on the institution the harvard itself uh, that how it can train you to be part of uh, you know this this greater broader community uh and country so uh it, it all obviously made a ton of sense as a as a growth uh, period. Um, also, it was two thousand eight. So when I arrived here, so everybody was going to graduate school. So uh, <laughs> and it was it was it was a good time to spend in graduate school and kind of um, uh, start looking for jobs like after the crisis was over. I hear you. And obviously you started looking and you definitely found something meaningful in a place called Google. So, so why Google out of all the places? I mean, obviously when you go to Harvard, you know, like the, the doors open, you know, and, and, and everyone wants, you know, a Harvard grad. So how do you land in Google? Why Google? Yeah, obviously, it, it, I was lucky, and it was it is an amazing place to work. And uh, I I worked on a couple of problems uh, around machine learning and aggregating uh, opinions and the network stuff, computational economics. That turns out Google cared about, so it, it was important for them on designing all the kind of the 
money making parts, the auctions, they run advertisements. So, and they were looking for people uh, on those topics. I was in this conference that uh, it's called NeurIPS. It is one of the top machine learning conferences out there. And I, I actually had two papers in there <laughs> presenting. And then I met this director, Google director in there. And um, she was uh, nice enough to give me a job. And it was an amazing place. I learned a ton. And I actually, I think I got a lot of, a lot of stuff done as well. And you were there for a little bit, I mean, close to two years. And this was around the time that you decide that maybe there's something bigger for you. Maybe you can actually launch your own thing, your own baby. And this led you to really build your first company, Clarity Money. Uh, and and I think it will be very interesting for, for the people that are listening and watching. What was that transition like from you coming up with the idea to all of a sudden making that jump because, you know, I'm sure that when you were calling back home and speaking with your parents and telling them that you were leaving Google, one of the most respected companies in the world to start your own thing, probably they thought you were completely crazy. So how was that like? Yeah, I mean, it was tough until I told them that I'm leaving. And the, the moment after I did that, it was like I got unchained. You know, it's just a lot of pressure to, you know, make that decision. Uh, and obviously a lot of uncertainty uh, when you are part of a company like Google or any other corporation, as a matter of fact, you have a lot of uh, risks kind of taken away. Um, uh, it was tough, but at the same time, there is a, there was and there is a, still a 20, 30 year, years out view that I kind of try to use in my decision making than like what is the next 5, 10 event. So when I was thinking, and I when I still think about twenty year two years out, uh, or at that moment, uh, advertisement ad tech, the way that companies like Google make money, uh, has been really beaten to death by these guys. I mean, uh, the, the the scale and like uh, uh, size of the operations and the money they make out of these really uh, uh, shows how much innovation has gone in there. So if you are, if you have aspirations to build something new, uh, you want to look for somewhere that um, not many people have explored. You know, that is part of uh, trying to figure out a place that you could actually actively imp be impactful. So, and I looked around and it was also part of my own problem that I, I wanted to know how you invest your money i want to know i was just making some money that i got me to think that okay what do i do with this do i do i keep my google stock or do i uh, diversify do i invest in this do i spend like this so i, I didn't have a source to really like uh, have a cl clear answer at least a clear view of what should i do so that kind of got me thinking how little technology has gotten into the consumer finance side there's a lot of technology in, um, you know, hedge funds, quant trading, no doubt, but um, not much on the consumer finance side, especially 2014, 15. Uh, and uh, that got me thinking, maybe that's an area that I can jump in and um, start making impact. So then, so then let's talk about, you know, the what was that event? I mean, do you remember that event where all of a sudden you said, you know what, I'm just going to go at it and, and do this thing? Yeah, I mean, it was more like a continuous uh, effort. Uh, and I gave myself and people around me chances to stop me from doing it by basically I wrote a proposal. Uh, I said Google, for example, Google Assistant back then was the early days of it. So... I was like, Google Assistant is a cool idea. Why not build it as a Google Assistant to help you with your financial decisions, right? And I went around, I talked to enough people uh, and to kind of get a good sense of, okay, if I was doing this in Google and I wanted to like get this done, with the, obviously I, I was just hired, you know, I was not like a director or <laughs> VP that has actually uh, capability to take high risk, large projects. So, um, but with, with whatever I could, I went around and I, uh, like with a slow process, I discovered that uh, there is a clear project here. It's not, it's not a bad idea. It's just 
there is an inherent risk there that uh, your Google director might not like to take. But as long as you have a kind of clean carved out risk that you think you can take, and it's a bet that you want to take, other folks don't, then go take it outside. So there's kind of that logical progression that helped me uh, basically to first validate the idea and then say, okay, this is good. Now, basically, there's the risk part that I should be the person taking it. Yeah. So then so then in this case, you go at it. I mean, what, what, what were some of those early days like at Clarity Money? How was that? Uh, well, I think there was a lot of uncertainty, obviously. But also something interesting was that there were many other people were trying to do similar things. Uh, I remember actually at some point I counted, there was like 13 other apps that wanted to help consumer. Uh, so, and it really boiled down to uh, the technology side that we had a great team on, as well as kind of thinking from the product side that, uh, and even even just the narrative, you know, how do you, how do you approach consumer? How do you tell them? Uh, like there was this, these uh, anecdotal things we, w- we would use that people would rather have a beer than go through their finances, right? So, and, and, and there's, there, there's a basically problem that you could tackle and a lot, many people were trying to tackle it. So it was a kind of verified problem, but at the same time, uh, seeing what would work was was a was a good problem to solve and think about as a team, um, and uh, um, and the space also has been very evolving, right? So 2010 to 2020, we we have had like so many fintechs, so many changes on how uh, you deal with your finances, even in the you know what I these days call traditional finance. Even in that world, uh, you had so much of change. Um, and uh, it was it was exciting also to be dealing with all those dynamics that uh, how fast companies were innovating, how fast products were coming out. Got it. So then, so then for Clarity Money, I mean, what ended up being the business model so that the people listening and watching get it? So uh, really fighting for consumer, basically telling them we are here for you and we will try to get you better deals. We are we are we will. Uh, act as like basically we are doing this for ourselves which in my case i was really doing it for myself uh at, at some level uh so the product basically so uh and and that really uh, is what the co- co- consumer is hungry for so with all the banks and everything about like personal finance it's a little bit uh, focused on the finance than the personal side. Uh, but there are things that uh, uh, when you connect with the customer, consumer, and tell them you're fighting for you and show them, make it easy for them to like act on things that are going to be better for them, uh, then you, you have at least them listening to you and you have a chance to make an impact. Okay, got it. Very cool. And Hossein, we're going to be uh, editing this part but for some reason, I'm hearing some noise. I don't know if that's because you're like over over the mic or something, or you're moving or something on top of the Maybe device. It my hand. I just took it off the yeah, laptop. Yeah, now, now it's fantastic. Now it's great. I think okay. that, that, that was probably it. It was probably my hand holding the laptop. Sorry. Okay, no worries. So so here, let's go back at it. So then in, in for Clarity Money, how much capital did you guys end up raising for the business? I think uh, at some point we, we we had raised more than thirteen million, probably fourteen. Okay, and obviously that was a um, pretty good outcome. I mean, being your first baby. I mean, it ended up getting acquired by Goldman Sachs, and you know some media outlets reported that it was about a hundred million. But how was that uh, that experience for you of going through the full cycle, and and why did you guys decide to sell? You know, versus you know perhaps continuing to build the business. It seems that you know at least having raised fourteen million, you guys were still kind of at, at an early stage in the in the game. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, um, on my side, it was obviously a, you know a lot of uh, things happening in those couple of years, and and I I, I wanted it. It was it's like you know the the 
the more you learn, the 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 more ready you are to like to do to do the next thing. So, uh, but that said, it's just uh, with with uh, the companies like that, you know the 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 good good side of it is also a lot of you know uh, hectic things. So. Um, but a ton of learning, things that um, uh, you can't learn in a school or you cannot learn, it, you know, by talking to people or by just watching, you know, YouTube videos. Uh, so um, in terms of, I, I think, uh, the fintech companies, not just Clarity Money, but looking at a kind of a good range of companies, good number of companies in the last 10 years, that they started and they basically ended up seeing the scale uh, uh, aspects as um, when you want to grow really big, right? So we have like some of the comp- some of the uh, startups out there. Even some of them tra- are trying to be banks, uh, applying for bank uh, charters. Uh, some of them were acquired by larger banks. The distribution is is a really key point, yeah. and and obviously a bigger um, an institution who has a goal to build the same product, provide the same service, has more distribution ca- capacity and capabilities. And I think uh, you see that in in many of the fintech out there that uh, they end up being observed in a in a larger, more heavy heavier momentum in terms of distribution. Um, and uh, that is, I think, an inherent property of uh, traditional finance. I I do see my new world, DeFi and decentralized finance and blockchain, to have uh, different mathematics um, uh, for some uh, fundamental reasons. So then let's talk about that, because after you did the a little bit of vesting and resting at Goldman Sachs, I mean, literally like not even a year, you uh, decide that it's time to go at it again. And here you started with Seymour. So, so why don't you tell us what, what's Seymour about? What's the business model? So Seymour started as a B2B uh, business, uh, providing services to other businesses in blockchain space by aggregating and making access to blockchain easier for everybody. So you didn't need to deal with a, a kind of a complex tech stack when you want to build a product on top of blockchain. So uh, 2018, uh, when the Seymour basically has started, uh, it was just after a big crash in crypto prices, which uh, leads to retail being burned out. All like even even VCs were not as interested, uh, and so they called it crypto winter. So it was really a time to uh, reflect and think about the B two B side, and uh, you know there was not much of a retail activity besides just people, you know, trading on Coinbase of the world. So, uh, uh, and the, but we saw basically, uh, we saw a continuous improvement from 2018, obviously to 2020, March 2020, that there was another crash because of COVID. Um, so, but the big inflection point for me and I think for this space was summer of 2020. They even call it DeFi summer, decentralized finance summer. What happened that you started seeing these uh, protocols that they could do, for example, Uniswap, that they could do exchange of assets uh, as a, just a protocol uh, uh, without any uh, centralized entity involved. And, uh, for example, Uniswap started surpassing Coinbase in volumes. So that moment for me was basically an inflection point, uh, realizing that now it's the time we could actually build a consumer product in DeFi, which I call it consumer DeFi, uh, as opposed to consumer finance. So uh, because you have, now you have the backbone, you have, for example, another protocol or a series of protocols uh, that are for lending. One of them is called Compound. You could actually go there. You could uh, you could lend your U.S. dollars there and earn like 10%, 11% interest in some cases. You could lend your crypto. You could borrow against your crypto. So you could basically do all these um, consumer finance um, activities, but with protocols, without needing 
to have anybody involved or any credit score involved and etc so that was the inflection point that we really started on pushing our retail product which is now Seymour app um, and that's where we are now with Seymour so how do you guys make money so uh, there obviously the b2b side we we sell uh, data there's monthly subscription there's setup fees um, and uh, API type pricing on, on the products that uh, are related to uh, doing uh, API calls, etc. So um, on the B2C side, uh, we are really uh, building ourselves as uh, the place you go to get better financial deals. So uh, uh, I like to see this as basically a Google of finance where you come in and you have a certain goal, the way that you would you want information from Google, I see the capital version of that. In fact, back in 2015, when I was going around in Google, I took Google's motto that says, uh, uh, make uh, 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 world information accessible uh, uh, to everybody. I, made, I said that, well, let's make the world's capital accessible and uh, useful universally. So what's the difference of capital and information? So it's, it, was, it has been five, six years, but now blockchain and these platforms enable us to think about capital the way we thought about information in internet age. So uh, basically you come in, you need capital, you want lend, borrow, you want exchange. You, 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 you have your intention, you come to the app and there are all these protocols who want to serve you. And we provide you the protocol that we think is the best for you to use by finding that best deal. That is the engine that Seymour offers you. In the world of open finance, decentralized finance, the deal maker, the Google is Seymour. And that is basically the way we think about um, a core value and how we monetize it as part of you know some of the protocols now actually uh, provide bonuses to the uh, providers like us that help people to come to the protocols. Um, some of the protocols provide bonuses to the uh, to the users that we would uh, naturally be able to get a cut of it, um, as well as any other product that consumer uses, be it a tax product, be it a, um, a data product, an accounting product. Uh, we do have partners that we provide leads to the to them. Uh, when our users want the product uh, to uh, by the partner, and we also have a lead generation revenue stream. Got it. So, so obviously you guys are still early. I mean, you've been at it for a couple of years only. So, how much capital have you guys raised to date? So we have some. Uh, 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 we the the total sum to date is, is uh, one million. Okay. Uh, we have also been a very lean company, and obviously we we have been making revenue for a couple of years now. So, uh, but we do have gross plans and uh, uh, the, the way I think about it and our board and company really uh, is built around uh, and uh, kind of uh, agrees with uh, the general uh, attitude of the uh, um, uh, keeping company lean and uh, really waiting for when is a good time to uh, make a big impact versus uh, just burning a whole bunch of money and seeing what happens, which is the kind yeah. of a common VC mentality. And I think that, you know, like once you've gone at it, you know, um, uh, you know, at least once, you know, in your case, you know, you're able to really see, you know, what what works, what doesn't, you know, it's like pattern recognition, you know, when it comes to the execution. So it makes total sense. I guess in this case, Jose, I want to ask you a question that I typically ask the guests that come on the show, and that is, if you had the opportunity to go back in time, you know, let's say you go into this time machine and you go back to where you were still at Google and you're able to have a sit down with your younger self. You know, maybe one of those times that you were coming out of the meatpacking district office in Google and you were going to have lunch or whatever. You're able to sit down with that younger Hossein and you are able to give yourself one piece of business advice before launching a business. What would you tell that younger or saying that was perhaps taking a look at, at launching something and leaving Google. Oh, that's a that's a great question. So uh, I I never thought about it that way, but 
I mean, obviously, uh, I can I can talk about a lot of things that I would I would I would say in that situation. But if you're looking for one line, right? There you go. Just one piece of advice. That's so. All uh, it always takes longer and costs more money. And that's why you're thinking about Seymour more as a twenty to thirty year project. So, um, and, and look, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're ambitious. You want to change the world tomorrow, right? Yeah. So, but, but forget about us. We are just these little guys, you know, trying to like uh, do whatever. But think about like Steve Jobs, right? This, this guy starts companies, like gets kicked out of his own company. Like if you look at his journey, he didn't come up with Apple like iPhone like overnight. This dude has been going back and forth, like through through really like tough things and successfully, right? Also like uh, investing in the meantime, like buying companies, selling companies. So if you think about it, th- th- uh, even for his vision to you know materialize and get closer to the reality of what he built, it takes the time and it costs a lot of you know effort and money. So. Uh, that initial ambition is great. It drives you and it has to be there, right? It is that kid's excitement about the playground. Uh, but 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 knowing that, that it's going to kind of, uh, it's going to be a longer ride, you know, getting, you know, how you buckle up and get ready. That's, uh, so I would, ju- I would just try to like kind of build that attitude a little bit more, not to stop. You know, the, the risk is like when you focus on that attitude, you might discourage, right? Yeah. But like, you know, how, how, you, uh, how you, you know, they, they, they treat a kind of a little kid trying to do something, be very encouraging, but also at the same time kind of have that uh, mindset that, Look, I have a great mission. I really want to do something that helps with leveling the financial playing field, helps with giving access to capital, because that's where I'm coming from. If, you know, the same flesh and blood uh, in, in U.S. or in a developing country who has talent uh, could could be as impactful if they have this access. So uh, but but uh, building s- such a thing is a lot of work, you know, and it takes long so I uh, and and for me to think that uh, it was going to happen between 2016 and 2018 it was good, it was ambitious and it helps with doing things. But at the same time, really buckling up and trying to build something that, you know, it, you know, it's going to change the world in 20 years. And with DeFi and consumer DeFi, I do know it's going to change the world in 10 to 20 years. I think I'm just trying to play a role here be part of it join the you know basically the the ride we like jump on this train and try to also help it if i can so i think that attitude uh, uh would have helped uh but I'm, I'm i'm not complaining i think i think it's all good i hear you i hear you so hussein for the people that are that are watching and listening what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, so send me a message, add me. I love to connect. Amazing. Well, Hossein, thank you so much for being on the Deal Maker Show today. Thank you very much, Alejandro.